Belgeet, my friend, welcome to Becoming the Channel. Hello, thank you for having me. I can't stop smiling. <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> you all, uh, before we started recording, I told Belgeet, my guides were like, Auntie Belgeet is here and she's going to talk about sex today. All the things that we wanted to know about it, but nobody ever told us. That's kind of where we're headed, I think, today. You are a registered sexologist. Congratulations on that. I know that that has been a long time, a long process that you've done a deep dive into studying and um, you've just been contributing nonstop in that area and healing sexuality and, and channeling sexual energy. So we're so happy that you're here with us. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So important, and, you know? It is, it's like core. I was driving home. My guides often talk to me when I'm driving. That's my kind of my quiet time. And I was driving home from the gym, preparing for our talk today. And they were reminding me of an early time. We've known each other for about what, five or six years, I think at this point, maybe a little bit longer, but that's, we've come together in the Akashic records many, many times. And I remember it must've been in 2021 because it was right after the jabs came out and my period went away and it was all like, inflamed and I couldn't figure out what was going on and I'm so sensitive and was I picking up on shedding or what whatever it was and you were able to just really drop in and support me with that in fact I think my period started like less than 24 hours after we talked oh wow I remember that that was a while back yeah. that was and I remember I messaged you and I'm like I'm doing my period dance <laughs> <laughs> That in itself was so healing for me because I was a kid who didn't get that experience of having a celebration around becoming a woman. And there are many, many of us, I think, who have that similar experience. So just even in your response to me sharing that with you, it was healing for me. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of woman that we have on our show today, everyone. Well, thank you. And yes, our periods are so important in how we cycle through and even transition when it stops, when we stop bleeding, right? Like it's, everything is so celebratory. And I feel that um, there's been such a disconnect with our relationship with our cycle as well. And then also, if you're going into perimenopause or menopause, um, you know, like really honoring that of you coming into being a wise woman and deepening your wisdom and connecting deeper with your ancestors as well. So uh, I've noticed that personally, which is noticing my cycle and, and honoring that, but even witnessing it in other people as well. For sure. And I know that so many of us are you know, kind of that cuspy millennial Gen X and even the bo the boomer generation are in this community as well. And we are approaching that time in our lives. And that was one of the questions is, am I entering into perimenopause? Like what's going on there? And there is this time in our lives, I think right now that we're entering into being the wise women and to being the wisdom keepers. And that is a great honor. And it is something that I know that you work with women on in many different arenas, the one I want to talk to you about today is business and channeling wealth consciousness. Yes. I love that. Where's a good place to dive into that? So I have like three different angles that are coming up, but I'm curious about what, where you would like to start with the relationship um, between sex and money and wealth consciousness. And yeah, because to me, like the wealth consciousness, like that's the byproduct as well when people want to know what their purpose is. So with business as well, like it's when I work with people, sexual energy, it's first and foremost for them to feel safe and drop into their body. Um, and so, yeah, but let's go into to the business piece because I feel like that's really important. It is one of the transitions I've seen in my own life and in the lives of my clients as they've made the, as we've made the transition from the corporate space, the nine to five, the salary, the bonuses, the retirement fund into entrepreneurship, consulting, and that kind of thing, there's a different relationship with money. Yeah. And I have a story to tell you. I think this is a great place for us to dive in. When I first started my coaching business, I became really good really quickly at high ticket sales. And my early clients were investing around $5,000 to work with me for the day. So this would have been 
probably like, let's say 2011, so 13 years ago. And I remember I, a woman had invested that, she paid in full, she came to Arizona to meet, to work with me for the day. And halfway through the day, I was so exhausted. I was so exhausted. I felt like I was having to explain everything to her and take care of her in this really weird way that I wasn't accustomed to at all. And I called my mentor, Barb, who I wrote my book with, and I was telling her that, and she stopped me and she said, Robin, she hired you because of your, an expert, because of your expertise. She said, you're a psychologist, not a prostitute. And I think that for me in that moment was such a key to transforming my own relationship with money, with being paid for my work. Like all of those things were entangled in this, not my maybe not my personal story, but certainly the generational genetic, societal and cultural influences, religious influences that we carry in our bones. What do you say about that? Yeah, it's so interesting because it's like a way of what society has taught us, whether it's through cultural programming, religious programming, uh, parental programming of how to show up as, well, let's just say as a female, as a girl, right? Um, and how that ties in sexually as well, we can go into the place of like fawning. And so being the people pleaser and just over giving and um, there could be other things too that are there in regards to the sexual energy and how that impacts and how you show up in business as well. So there's many areas in which you can go like in regards to what you shared about that, but I also feel like the stronger piece too is how we were raised as, as a female um, and the programming around gender as well and showing up. And I feel like that deeply ties into our sexual energy. And once we are able to rewire and reprogram who we are as a feminine, as a female and how we wanna show up, that also changes our, our ability of what we are capable of, our self-worth, um, and how we choose to deliver. We're not coming from a place of people pleasing or um, overriding our um, those yeses and nos, our, our boundaries even as well. It's a different frequency too of like how you show up and when you're delivering something with someone. And it's funny that you brought that up because I used to have that too. Like I would have like VIP days back in the days in like 2011. <laughs> same. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was sort of the same thing. Like it was, I noticed because I was so excited and I was transitioning from, you know, I transitioned from working in the architectural industry. So it was a nine to five plus lots of overtime uh, job. And so my mindset was, you know, just, feeding this thing outside of me versus being a conduit versus allowing myself to be a conduit for someone. So I, I did notice myself being in like complete exhaustion. Once I was able to really tie in of, you know, honoring our own sexual power and how that ties in of how we show up in general, then I noticed I was more clear with my boundaries and um, and, and it's also like how I chose to deliver the message as well and support the person. There are like three different angles that came forward. One is the fawning response is a trauma response along with the fight, flight, and freeze. So when the, you get into the people pleasing and the over giving and the overdoing and the over, 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 and I'm not enough and I don't want them to be bad at me. So I'd better do even more like that whole piece is, can be related to trauma from the time you're a little kid and how you're trained to show up in the world as a girl. Um, the piece about, um, well, let me just stop there. What, what's your take on that? Oh yeah. Like a hundred percent, especially if someone went through some sort of violation, right? Like uh, sexual violation, especially <laughs> that can really um, fall into fawning or if you were raised in a very religious upbringing. Um, I was raised in a very uh, strict East Indian cultural, cultural upbringing um, and religious upbringing and Indian girls at the time, um, you know, 
had to really, in a way, make sure everyone else was comfortable before themselves, like putting everyone else first before their own self. Mm -hmm. And so that was very familiar to me. And the piece around healing that was actually healing my sexual energy because our sexual energy is our creative life force. It's our universal energy. It's the closest thing to our spiritual self. And when you connect with that, you regain and understand who you are as an individual. You understand who you are, um, like your own identity, even your sexual whole being. And when I mean sexual whole being, I don't just mean like the act of sex. I mean, who you are as, as a whole being. And so that shifted me out from the fawn response. And it took me a while to even know that I was fawning. I just called it people pleasing, but I didn't realize it was a protection mechanism because I was wanting to make sure that I was safe in my environment. And I was doing that even with my clients as well. So that was a big one. Mm -hmm. When you have the experience of selling high ticket programs and even like the three and 5k, I mean, I know that people invest in themselves at much higher levels with you and me these days, but even at those levels, it can really press some buttons around, am I going to do enough? Mm -hmm. And what if I don't do enough? What's the cost of me not doing enough? Yeah. 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 And when, when we relate it back to what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a sexual being, I think that that's just so, so core and something that is an invitation to heal and transform. And it's, it's like our role as a woman too. It's like our role. Um, it's, it's been changing, you know, we've been able to now be in the corporate industry where back then it wasn't like that. But it's like all these identities being tied to us, but are actually not of us. And those identities could be the wife, right? The mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the friend, the caretaker, um, and so and so. And we can really lose ourselves in these um, different identities, even though they're very important. Um, but it's important to not lose yourself as well. And that's been a really big thing. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a role stripping activity that I learned in graduate school where you wrote down on little note cards, all of the different roles that you play. Oh, wow. Mom, daughter, wife, sister, mm -hmm. friend, architect, psychologist, whatever it is, name all of them. And one by one in this role stripping, you just take them away. And now you're no longer that. And now you're no longer that. Mm. And it would put people real and these are graduate students who are studying psychology I remember this whole class being thrown into an existential crisis if I'm not these things then who am I exactly and that's a great exercise by the way that's a great exercise to like do now like with clients as well but like yeah it's like who am I but that's the beauty of it as a with it all is like when you are stripped of those different projections per se, then it's like you get to cultivate that and create that on your own and, and discover who that is, like who, who you are and be able to then align to your purpose. And then that's how you're able to really uh, succeed in your business. But that's also part of cultivating the wealth consciousness as well. Because um, to me, wealth consciousness is it comes through when you're in alignment to who you are as a being. And, and also in alignment with your purpose. You're not in this place of servitude um, or trying to uh, perform or play a certain identity that's actually not of you. I'm just reflecting as, as you're talking about how powerful business is in creating transformation in, for us as individuals oh. and coming, coming home to our real selves. Yeah. I can't remember where I heard it from. It was probably our mutual friend and mentor, Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs> she said, if you want to learn the most about yourself, you start your own business. Like yes. if you receive the most transformation, you start your own business. And yeah. I highly agree because as soon as I started my own business, it was like, 
oh, wow, there's, there's a lot of stuff there that I need to look at. And, and it always, it's an, you're always evolving as well, but it's, yeah, it's been one of the most profound transformation is having a business. Yeah. So you were a STEM girl, would you say with coming back to architecture and, and working in that field for the early part of your career, what created the transition for you into the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so it was interesting. So I've been in the architectural industry for seven years. And um, in between that time, I had a panic disorder and also was diagnosed as being having depression. And I didn't realize I was depressed. I just thought that was normal. <laughs> it wasn't until I had the panic disorder. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, oh yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. What, what year was that? I'm curious about uh, the, the timing of that. So I was diagnosed in 2003 and then I went on antidepressants till 2005. And I got out of the architectural industry in 2009, but that that point, that tipping point in 2005 was when I was on these antidepressants, I'm like, why am I on them? And I remember that day at the time I was living in Toronto, I went to my doctors and uh, she was this European woman and she said something, I think she said it on purpose to uh, activate me in a deep way, but she said, you know, you probably have to be on this for the rest of your life. And when she said that, I remember I, I didn't say anything. I just got up and I walked out and I was shocked because I was like, nope, not on my watch. Am I going to be on antidepressants for the rest of my life? Because I knew, uh, I still wasn't feeling right. Even though the panic attacks subsided, um, I wasn't feeling right. I was still feeling disconnected. And, and that's when I found a homeop homeopathic doctor and a naturopathic doctor. And it was through homeopathy that I just kind of came out of this dark tunnel. And uh, that's how I even met Jennifer it was like way back then. And she did an Akashic record reading on me. And I was like, what, what is this? And so I had like two lives. I was like learning energy modalities and then I had my corporate life, those two different pieces. And I can't relate to that at all. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then what I started to notice, like with architecture, I always got put into doing site planning. And I think it was just so fascinating because I was always into crops, like crop circles and stuff and, and like aerial views of things. And so it was perfect. And then one day, and this was like, in 2008, I was working by then I was in Vancouver. Um, but I started channeling sacred geometry on my uh, on the computer. And my colleague said, Well, what are you doing? Because she could actually feel the, the energy coming through. And I was like, I don't know. So I continued during work. <laughs> and then, and then I sent it home. And when I printed out the geometries, I actually have a few examples here. Like this is one of them. Mm -hmm. I have one. You did one for my business. Yes, I did. And then like when I printed it out, I felt the vibration and I, I started crying. Like it was such a homecoming. Um, and so it was like, oh, instead of seeing, you know, it's like we have a blueprint for buildings but we also have a blueprint of our soul, right? In each, in each carnation. And so I started to see how there was such a similarity and that was a way for me to like bridge. And eventually by 2009, I'd already became a, a Akashic Record practitioner and also at the time a Reiki practitioner. And then I was so busy. I was like, I was living two different lives and I was doing a lot of leadership programs and surrounded by entrepreneurs. And one of them was like, Hey, what are you going to leave your job? And I was like, I don't know. And so they said, let's put a date on. So I put March 20th. <laughs> I remember the date 2000, 2009. 
And uh, pretty much a week before I asked my bosses that I actually asked to get laid off and they did. Um, and so it was wonderful because they gave me a severin package. I got laid off. I had a, you know, a good few months to get me started on my business. And then I, I did hire Jennifer as a, a full-time mentor to understand and get me out of my, my uh, nine to five mindset as well. So yeah, that's how I transitioned. With the bridge of the blueprint. Yeah. And the Akashic Records. Of and the Akashic Records. The Akashic Records are just game changing to me. Yeah. I'm assuming the same happened to you too. Yeah. You know, I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression in 98. So just a little bit before you, but same kind of thing. I was having panic attacks. I was having early morning waking, not being able to get back to sleep. And somebody, find, one of my colleagues at work told me, I was working in a biosafety level three lab with all kinds of crazy microorganisms. And my colleague pulled me aside one day and she said, you're depressed and you don't have to feel this way. And I was like, really? <laughs> I didn't know that, you know? So that was kind of the beginning of my journey. And then, um, I started my, my spiritual apprenticeship right around the same time I started my PhD. So I was doing both tracks and working in the pharmaceutical industry and building a house and, you know, doing, cause that's what we do, like all the things. So, and I, the first time I ever dreamed about the Akashic records was probably like 2001 and they came to me in a blueprint. Oh, wow. And I didn't know what they were until much later. And when I discovered the soul journeys method that you and I practice, and the guides were like, that's what we were, that's what we were showing you all those years ago. So we end up here in our homecoming in the Akashic Records and what a blessing it has been for, you know, a multitude of reasons, including the healing and transformation of my own money story. And, um, and I'm sure for you as well. I mean, all of those nuances that we experience as women in business, as leaders, with lifetimes of trauma around what it means to be a woman and a leader have been really transformed quite remarkably in the past several years, for sure. Don't you think? Oh, a hundred percent. And like, um, you know, especially for myself and my journey of growing up in a very strict East Indian upbringing, it was like also the roles of the women. Mm -hmm. It was like a girl and like, there was so much um, imprinting that was very repressive. And so to be like, oh no, like I can make this much, I can create this, I can be this, and I can be at the head here uh, doing what I love to do. Um, there was a lot of work um, that that needed to be done in the records and healing that. And, I, and it's still, it's like still evolving. Like I still find new things. And I'm like, holy crap, that just came from like transgenerational programming. <laughs> Here we go. You know, Here we and, go. Well, yeah. the conversation you and I had a couple of weeks ago. So you guys, Beljeet and I have, this is our relationship. We check in with each other. And if one of us has something, we just get on a call and we get in our records and we clear it. That's just the way we roll. Right. And so I have this mole on the back of my head that I've had for probably my whole life. It doesn't bother me. My hairstylist every once in a while will like clip it with just combing, but that's it. And I hadn't seen it or thought of it for a long, long time. And then last week I was in California at a different place and I could see the back of my head in the mirror and I saw this mole and it just creeped me out. And I got on the call with you and I'm like, what even is this? And it was this whole, but it wasn't the mole. It was just the, the generational, um, my one of my great grandmothers is First Nations, and she is front and center in healing and transforming what's been going on in my on my father's side of the family. And that was revealed through the conversation that I had with you. Um, and she has been very active in the last couple of weeks since we met. Yeah, I definitely feel like the ancestors are coming in strong. And it's so funny that you mentioned about your your grandmother because earlier today, I felt my dad's mom come through and I've, I've never really connected with her because she passed away when my dad was really young. And, and I was like, oh, it's so nice to feel her presence and knowing that she was 
always so fierce and strong and um and I feel like there's new wisdom that's being um that's coming through for for all of us and uh the ancestors are are truly helping they're they're kind of paving the way and looking at mm-hmm. looking at being like yeah uh, fuck this shit we're coming mm-hmm. in. you know yeah. what I mean and well, you're lining us yeah yeah I learned so July 31st was the would have been the 30th anniversary of my first marriage had I stayed married to this person my college sweetheart and um so I married him when I was 12 I'm kidding um <laughs> I mean, you do the you do the yeah. math, but, but yeah. I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> but anyway, my grandmother came in, and she had told me after so after we made sense of all that a couple weeks ago, she came in in the ensuing days and said they that they were preparing like a new garb for me to wear that was not a wedding dress, and it was not me having to sacrifice myself on the altar of marriage anymore, but really reclaiming who I am as a woman, as a leader. And she said to me on my anniversary, I was, my guides talk to me when I'm walking Cooper. Mm. So, um, cause it's, you know, it's quiet and Cooper's doing his chasing lizards and stuff. So it just gives me an opportunity to, and she came in and she said, she said, part of the problem in my dad's family is that she cursed all the men uh. because she, because they were such jackasses. They really legit were jackasses. Her, the ones that she was First Nations and she was married into this um, English family through the Hudson Bay Trading Company. So there was that, like, it was like a an alliance or a, do you know what I'm talking about between the First Nations people and the, and the traders? And yeah. she got caught in that. She was property and they were assholes to her and she cursed them. And she said, every man in that family have held this curse. And it's a curse of around depression, around kind of that, not a desperation energy, but kind of that just deep sadness Mm -hmm. um, that showed up in my father's lineage for as long as I know about it. So she was clearing that the other night as well. Just that, you know, she said, I didn't realize the extent. Yeah of my anger. It was righteous anger, but yeah. the extent of it and what that means now, you know, just in terms of going forward in terms of my family with, even with regard to business, because those guys were entrepreneurs, yeah. they were the traders and the the merchants. So definitely that would have affected their businesses and inadvertently affected mine. Yeah. I also like, I was just thinking about how you went through anxiety and depression as well. And that's probably what you were mm-hmm. even. Up yes. On. Um, yes she said that she said so on my wedding day when I was I was 23 when I got married and on my wedding day high catholic mass I'm kneeling at the altar with my soon-to-be husband and I had this wave of nausea like I almost passed out and I remember him leaning over and asking me if I was okay and my grandmother brought that forward and she said that was not just your experience she said that was my experience and being married off to this person Hmm. and you know the power loss and the the being basically owned um or um held captive by this this contract so so that pretty much like shows us like how much transgenerational programming there is that does get in the way of our wealth consciousness and also even with sexual energy and how that all ties in and and especially if like you were forced to get married or if that was your that was part of a trade um even like arranged marriages as well Mm -hmm. it's like that forcefulness does impact um how you show up and yeah there's a lot of anger because you do you 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 do lose your identity in that way and then you're trying to find your place in the world so yeah it just and I bring that forward not to make it about me so much as just like to illustrate that my realization in that conversation I had with my grandmother is that 
on that day that I was getting married, I didn't feel like I had a choice either. And I like literally stood on the altar and prayed that somebody would stop it. And she told me, she said, that was not just you. That was me. Wow. And so when we look at that, just in terms of just to bring it back into wealth, consciousness, business, money, and so on, like when you're that disconnected from your personal sense of power, mm. not through anything that you've done. Like, I thought it was just me. I thought that there was something wrong with me, but looking back and being able to see the generations of women who had been impacted by that one, I'm using the word trade because I don't know what else to use. Um, yeah, that that would have deeply impacted a woman's ability to be fully and wholly herself and to belong to herself. Yeah, I definitely feel, and thank you for sharing that. I definitely feel it's important to know our history of like our mom's mom or dad's mm -hmm. mom and even fathers as well. Um, again, I was literally thinking about this too. I was, I was like, I wonder if I should just ask my dad, like, what was, what was my grandmother? Like, I know he, he talked about her, but he, he not, I don't really know much of her. And I was like, you know, I feel her so strongly and, you know, I'm curious what the history was and why she passed so early and like, what, what was going on in her life? Um, Cause even, uh, you know, with parents too, sometimes they kind of like want to brush things underneath the rug and be like oh no no he, he's everything fine. is fine my mom was, my mom's mom was great yeah <laughs> meanwhile you know you know died of an illness or whatever right mm -hmm. so it's and then when those things get brushed underneath the rug it's like we like inherit it like we we don't even realize that we take it on and then we're trying to figure out like why certain patterns are showing up, not realizing that there's these pieces. I actually had a client who was sexually violated and um, came out and really like as soon as 2020 hit, she was like, all right, I'm ready to work through this. And I was like, all right. And she started to, um, so I always say like the vagina, like literally mimics our throat chakra. It's all about our expression. And she started to get her voice back. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh my God. And she actually confronted the person that actually violated her. She wrote him a letter. She told her parents, um, which was a really big thing for her. Um, and, and just started to really speak, speak up and people started to come forward and be like, oh my God, like, I didn't know this was happening. Then she couldn't help it, but she's like, I still feel angry at my dad. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm so angry at him because this also ties into like her business, her, you know, what she does and, and also finance as well. Like there was just something there because they, they work in the same field. And finally, uh, we did some clearing and literally the next week she saw her dad and he finally told her that when he was young he was molested like he was violated and then she something switched in her she was like oh my god like I'm I this is what I was feeling because I was like angry at my dad because I knew he wasn't telling me something and he finally told me and it was like the biggest breakthrough so she was able to like unlock herself from that and now fully focus on her business and, and not work for her dad per se, or if she does, it's, it's a different energy. Um, so that was huge. And I really started to see of like, oh, like our ancestors is, is it's actually really important to, to really understand and, and discover that if we can. I love one. Thank you for sharing that and illustrating the power of really deeply and safely exploring and understanding the traumas, especially the sexual traumas from childhood and even, and obviously adulthood too. One of the things that's really compelling about the work that you do is that you bridge the connection to what's happening for someone sexually, literally with their genitals and then how that relates on the soul level. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So literally with the genitals, I mean, like if someone is experiencing numbness or pain or like literally just can't have sex or they feel like they can't really reach an orgasm or they feel like sexually they're not satisfied, I look at, okay, what's happening in 
and, you know, how they show up in general and how that relates to their soul. Um, so for example, um, I'm working with a couple where one was really dependent on her partner to receive an orgasm and he kept going into his head and feeling like he has to perform and fix things. But when we went into the soul level and the Akashic field, I was like, oh, you actually don't feel safe to be in your body and there's protection mechanisms. You're actually not in your sacral whatsoever. Um, when you're, whether it's solo with yourself or with your partner, and and so you're dependent on someone else externally to fulfill that, but they pick up on that. If they notice that there's something missing, um, naturally for men, they're fixers, right? They're like, well, let me fix this. And then they try to perform mm -hmm. it. They feel inadequate. Yeah. Yeah. And confident and like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I, well, I guess this is not working, mm -hmm. but it's not that there's a mirror in that. And so I mirrored that back to, okay, well, how does this work with how you show up in general in life and, and with friends and, and your this thing around trust, where do you not trust other people? Where do you not allow yourself to receive? And she really got that. She was like, oh, right. I do that all the time. And so she saw how, how she was showing up was something very much deeper to more of a, a trauma response. Like it was fight or flight. And she noticed all of her mechanisms have been fight or flight. And so our genitals will mimic a fight or flight response too. We can experience numbness where that's can be a sort of leaving the body disassociating and that can also show up in our business we can dis disassociate you know when we're trying to call in clients and, and when we're trying to work with someone people will feel it they can't connect with you or let's just say in your genitals there's some fight or flight um so that can show up as pain or irritation um and then how it reflects back to business, right? It's like, you may notice that you're always fighting or deflecting or um, triangulating and, and whatnot. Um, so I really bring it back to, okay, so this is what's going on here. And I bridge it to how does this show up in your relationship with your partner or solo or dating? And how does this show up in your business? And then once they connect the dots, they're like, oh, this is so wild. It's like how our genitals are so connected to this. This makes sense because most of it is a, like most of it is energetic blocks and trauma and whether it's micro and macro. And once we start to literally work with the genitals, and of course I use somatic practices to safely get someone to connect to their genitals and it takes time, but to bring that awareness, even the knowledge, like really understanding our anatomy, because we weren't taught that in school, maybe like very little, very little, um, it brings that level of empowerment and connection. And so naturally what starts to happen is that people start to then speak their truth they start to really express their gifts and talents because they feel safe in their body they feel safe to express themselves they feel supported and there's not this lingering story that keeps repeating it's like they've gone past that and and then the byproduct is that they become even more multi-orgasmic right um, and understanding, so I call it misdirecting sexual energy. And when we misdirect our sexual energy, that's when our energy falls into, um, you know, we have our three lower chakras. So the, so the solar plexus, the sacral and the root chakra, our solar plexus is all about our power. And then our sacral is all about our creativity. And then our root is all about security and well-being. However, if we are disconnected in either one of those chakras, they start to reverse. So the solar plexus goes into control. Uh, the sacral tends to go into manipulation. And then uh, the root goes into insecurity. And so this is how a lot of money stuff can arise. Because if you've got some sexual trauma as well, and, and I've noticed this a lot, like when there's sexual blocks, 
there's also financial blocks because the financial blocks is all about security and well-being. But if you don't trust or whatever that programming may, might be, then there's a lot of energy leaks. So once you heal that, you're able to redirect your sexual energy to serve the highest good. You're not directing it to fulfill an unmet need. I want you to say that one more time for the people in the back, or actually everyone rewind and listen to that again, because that is pure gold, what you're talking about in terms of the relationship between healing trauma, realigning your sexual power in the proper way so that everything flows. But it is that over control, manipulation, and then insecurity, like that, that's a trifecta of disaster waiting to happen in a business. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it, and it shows up like in very subtle ways. It can show up as, you know, even feelings of jealousy and envy, and it can slide into that energetic of manipulation. And when I sense that I'm like, oh, there's a disempowerment piece here. And like, how can we shift that, right? So that you can redirect that energy. And so normally people don't think about sexual, again, sexual energy as our life force. They think of it as just the byproduct of the action of sex, but it's there's more to that. And it's and that's also societal programming. Um, you know, society has taught us to keep it as the side dish and it's only meant to procreate and that's it. But it's it's our co-creative energy. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it was you on socials. I think that you said this, that we are all products of sexual energy. Is that, I don't know if I use the right languaging. Yeah. Did we're you say of, that? Yeah. We're made of sex. So why not talk about it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and that I, was for me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm from sex but because of the programming, right? Again, it could be transgenerational. It could be cultural, religious, um, and cultural is very heavy, like societal as well. It's like, oh no, we don't, we don't talk about it, but just understanding if we come from it, then why not understand it, you know, and, and really honor it. Like, that's the thing. It's like the, it's been disconnected. And to me, I also feel like, you know, there's other agendas as to why, that's been disconnected. And I honestly feel that's because to me, sexual energy is the most powerful thing. <laughs> it dictates, dictates everything. And to me, like if people really honor their sexual energy and knew how to cultivate that, knew how to really heal and connect with that, I swear to you, it's Italy world peace, you know, we'd be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I want to talk about masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. because so here's here's what I learned in grad school I was so relieved to find this research that gifted women women who are high, highly able meaning they're have very fast brains in our heads highly creative figure things out quickly make sense of things know what to do about them tend to be more like boys and men than they do like average girls and women so less, maybe less, I'm using air quotes, feminine, more androgynous. Mm -hmm. but there is this overlay of what's going on culturally and societally around what it means to be around gender. We'll just use that as the kind of the umbrella. But then individually, how we show up as women and I refer back to Barb, my mentor from grad school, who I wrote the book with said one time, she she grew up in the late 60s, 70s. She was kind of that first gen of feminism, that first wave of feminism. And she said, women in business take remedial masculinity lessons in order to survive. Basically, you have to figure out how to be a, a guy in order to survive. And that I think has been propagated throughout the, the, the generations as well. So I'd love to have kind of your perspective on that, the gender conversation as we're talking about sexual energy and business. So the way that I honestly look at things is we each have our own feminine energy and masculine energy. Um, so it's like a 
uh, governing conception energy. And when we learn to work with these two different energies, and, and it's interesting, like I've studied Tibetan Tantra, so there's like legit, like a feminine masculine energy in which when you practice the meditations and whatnot, the confusion that can arise is the how it links to the gender roles. Because to me, if you've mastered working with your masculine energy, it doesn't make you more of a man per se. You've just mastered working with your masculine energy. That's all that is. And there might be a lack of working with the feminine energy inside of you. And that's that, that you're able to balance that out when you, when you choose to, but I feel like, because we've got such a strong societal programming around the roles of gender, uh, this is what females do. And this is what, you know, what males do. And, and then added to it, we've got cultural programming as well. We've got societal programming of how genders need to show up. And, and, and so when that ties together with those programming, it causes an imbalance with our masculine, like our internal masculine and feminine energy. And so going back to, you know, the era of feminism and like, there is like a fight to be like, I, I, I need to connect with this energy. Like I'm coming out of the shell and, and now I'm going to, you know, really connect with it. Uh, but to me personally, I don't see that as being too masculine. That's just mastering your own masculine energy. Um, and then, you know, I, I also done like some research around like understanding like colonialism and how that's taken over as well. Like we have to understand that, and the impact that that has had on uh, gender roles um, and how it's impact our internal mechanisms of our feminine and masculine energies. And also the, the repression of our internal feminine energy based on the repression of the external parts as well. So we are trying to, uh, well, many of us have broke free from that and because of that freedom, it's like sometimes it can be betrayed, not betrayed, portrayed as being too masculine. But what if it's actually a balance? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and like what is being feminine? Like people define feminine as being super girly, but again, that's just what society has taught us. So I really like I've really gone into. And, and quite honestly, like I've worked with some people that identify as non-binary and I've accepted that. I was like, great, because they, where they come from, like their lineage, they came from a lineage where there are more than two genders culturally, right? And so they're trying to re, like rediscover who they are uh, as a whole sexual being. If that's what they, if that's how if that's how they have to label themselves, then so be it. But as long as they, as long as any, as long as everyone understands that there's a balance with the male and the masculine energy within ourselves, when they become unbalanced, no matter what gender you are, <laughs> there's no sexual sensation, right? That creates a lack of disconnect. And that lack of disconnect creates a lack of connection to your purpose, to your gifts and your mission. That is such a brilliant way of helping us understand the role of gender and, you know, gender as a social construct and how there are those of us who question that. I certainly did earlier in my life. And I know that the generations that have come after us certainly do as well and redefining what it means to just be a person. And yet to your point, when there's a disconnect there is no sexual energy. Like it's a shutting off of the sexual energy yeah. or shutting down. And that's yeah. the, that's the thing that we, I think have a responsibility to talk about and look at. Yeah. And, and sexual energy doesn't have gender. Sexual energy mm -hmm. does have the male mm -hmm. masculine energetic inside. Mm -hmm. Once you know how to work with that and cultivate that, 
then we truly understand our sexual identity as whole. To me, where there's a lot of fighting and bickering, and I want to say it's this way, it's that way, left, right, it's because there's a confusion of what sexual energy is. And people have not done enough um, excavating to really connect with that. Once they connect with that, it's almost like that static that, you know, the bickering and all this stuff kind of like dissipates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you become world peace. Yeah. And world peace. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she, what do you have coming up that you would love to share with us? Oh, um, I'm actually working on a few things. So I do have a program, actually, um, I'm working with someone who is from Turkey. So we're going to work with Middle Eastern women and South Asian women to um, really uh, go through religious programming, cultural prog programming and healing their sexual energy and restore their power through that because there has been so much repression sexually um, through our culture and, and religion as well. Um, so that's coming up uh, towards the end of September. And then I'm also still doing my one-on-ones, which I love so much because everyone is so unique. Uh, so yeah, that's what I have offered. And then I also have the Tantra portal. Um, so I'll have recordings for that as well. That takes women on the journey to connect back to their sexual power and de-armor, de-armor their genitals and really bridge that to their soul's mission. Is that where you talk about all the different kinds of orgasms too? Yes. How many? We have like 15 plus. <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I'm so glad you're doing this work. Thank it's you. been a liberating conversation with you today. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll put all of Belgique's links in the show notes or in the description so that you have access to those. And oh, thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Always enjoy connect with you. Love it. All right. I'll see everybody next time.